Good morning, everybody. So I'm standing here by our native garden here at Science Museum. Um, I was asked to make a video about native plants. Um, and as you just saw fluttering around um, is the monarch butterfly. Uh, so planting uh, natives, there is a sort of a ethical um, part of it to where, you know, we want to support our ecosystems and and that monarch that's a good example of that so the one of the declines for the um monarch population is a lack of uh food source as they're migrating from mexico to um to canada which is uh actually the longest migration of any insect uh, and they and they do a lot of things along that path that like uh, spread pollen. So they're responsible for a lot of the genetic uh, diversity. And I showed this earlier in another video, uh, but I'll show it again here in case you haven't seen it. So this plant emerging is Esclepias tuberosa. Uh, it's commonly known as the butterfly weed, and you can see all the little dots on um on this plant and those are all monarch eggs uh there's some next door with another little one uh, right there by that leaf there so the so the native plants not only support um monarchs but of course all other insects so these insects have evolved with these plants over uh, thousands of years um and, a, and um, so it's an, and it's important to do so, but also with the insect and supporting wildlife aside, um, when people ask me about starting gardens, um, I always ask them what they want, and I usually get the same answer, which is I want something pretty, but um, is going to be low maintenance. So. Um, I always go right to natives uh, because, well, they're native. They're used to our climate, um, so they're going to be able to handle the, uh, the the droughts and the heat. And in case of Oklahoma, the the dramatic fluctuations in temperature, um, and um, and they also are going to uh, handle uh, watering a lot better. So. So for instance, um, the typical lawn, Bermuda or fescue, uh, their root depths are about um, four inches or so. And a lot of people make the mistake of watering their lawn every other day or even worse every day. And what, what that does is that, is that encourages a shallow root system. So what happens is those those roots stay up to the surface because they don't have to go down to get the water um, and then when summer rolls around and we get that real hot blazing sun uh, it heats up that soil surface and your grass starts uh, stressing out and then people will see that their grass is stressing out so they'll start throwing more water at it all that water uh, also helps um, germinate weed seeds so then they're putting you know pre-emergence and fertilizers down whereas um they could just water deep and infrequent which is um you put down you can like for instance for like a tree you could put a hose uh, just barely turn on the water put a drip and just lay it next to your tree and let it let it soak for an hour or so um and th what that does is that was encourages the roots to go deep um, and then when summer rolls around, that tree or that plant that you water deep and infrequent um, now has its roots all the way down to the subsoil and it had a access to um, the, the water down there. So it, it gets it through the summer. And that is what our native plants do really well. So I'll, we'll look at a couple here and I will say, um, I'll give you another fancy term, um, what we call native var. Uh, so that's a cultivated native, something that they took 
that they found in a field and they they bred in um, characteristics of it. So this this plant, this purple flower, is a good example of a, a native R. This is a Verbena homestead, um, a really great ground uh, cover, um, full sun, most of our natives will be. It roots from the stem, so it can cover an area really well. Um, it's great for, um, for butterflies. Uh, so I'll pull off one individual flower here, and oops, that's a cluster. Um, it's hard to do this one-handed. Okay, so here's one single flower, and if you'll notice about it, it's a tubular. So if you want to attract butterflies to your garden, you want plants that have this style of flower, this tubular flower, because what happens is uh, the butterfly um, is one of the only insects that have that long proboscis, that mouth part, so they can um, go into that flower and, uh, and reach its nectar. Um, another good native plant, uh, Coreopsis, this is the Coreopsis verticulata, um, moonbeam, it's your typical daisy flower, another good ground cover, um, and then our foliage plants are our grass this is a little blue stem there's also switchgrass which is a, a good one indian grass is another good plant um, and then coming up here this one is gallardia and this is uh oklahoma uh, state wildflower and i'll i'll pause the video and we'll go out to um, another native area and i'll show you some that are blooming uh, this is another native r uh penstemon It'll bloom, it'll bloom probably at maybe 24, 36 inches. It has nice uh, tubular flowers that are this big and the bumblebees um, crawl inside. Um, it's it's, it's Pensamon digitalis and the digitalis comes from um, digit because it'll fit over your finger. But digitalis is actually the genus of foxglove and the um, blooms look very similar. Uh, this guy here... This is my favorite native. This is a Rudbeckia maximus. And you can see last year's blooms that we left up there because the birds love getting the seed pods. This has the typical um, Rudbeckia cone flower type bloom. It, it has a, a large cone and then yellow, a large black cone in the center and then yellow reflexing uh, petals that kind of hang down. So it's it's striking because the the flower is tall and, and but and the flower is also uh, large. So there's a lot of good um, good ones. This is a liatris that's coming up. Um, it'll bloom with a kind of a cluster of purple flowers. And then um, over here on our Monarch Way station, this guy coming up is um, Echinacea pallida. Uh, it, it looks just like your typical um, echinacea, except the petals are um, folded down. Uh, they're a little more uh, elongated, and it, it's uh, reflexed. Um, I, I like them because they're just different from the typical um, echinacea you can buy at the shopping center. And also, they've, they've been lasting a little longer here in the gardens. Now, echinacea is a perennial but it's a short-lived perennial, so just because it's perennial doesn't mean it's lived forever. Usually echinacea will last, will survive about two, maybe three years, and, and then you'll lose it and you'll have to plant it again. Now, we do have a couple of shade uh, natives. This guy here, Aquilea canadensis, is columbine. Now, it has those really cool spurs on the back of the flower. Um, so this is a good shade plant, and there are hundreds of varieties of them. Um, so just a great, a great plant if you if you have some have some shade. So I'm gonna pause the video, and then we're gonna walk out to this other area, and I'll show you a couple more. All right, guys, here I'm back at uh, the parking lot actually of our entrance here at the museum. This is the Indian blanket flower, the Glardia. It's a it's a it's an annual, but it recedes every year. And actually, this whole area um, has been receding itself for about two years now. So there's um, 
There's another type of uh, Coreopsis. Um, this is um, Monardia bee balm. They're a really cool blooming uh, plant. It's it's a uh, Monardia citra. If you crush it up and smell it, it smells citrusy. Um, it can be used in teas. Um, there's a couple other things now. There's a basket flower, and this would this is a what they say is a, a wildflower, not necessarily native to Oklahoma. So, I like this area. It says it's in our parking lot, so it gets a lot of heat. Um, helps us not spending a, a bunch of money. We just re we just seeded it. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit about trees, uh, native trees. Now, um, this here is our Kentucky coffee tree. Uh, starting to leaf out, it's known as the stump tree because the the leaves are are large. Like this this hole from here all the way to here is one leaf, and they'll get they'll get larger, uh, 24 um, 24 inches, and maybe even bigger. But when it defoliates, it leaves like these little stumps. Um, but it, it is a dioecious, so it's got male and female. So this is a female. You can see those big coffee pods, bean pods. Here's one. So when it defoliates, it holds on to these pods, and it's it's uh, attractive. Get uh, provide some winter interest. So we'll go uh, we'll go look at a couple more trees. So we planted this guy uh, um, last fall. Um, First thing I wanted to point out is the arrangement of the foliage. So they're opposite, opposed to alternate, which is what most tree species are. Um, so when I try to ID a, a tree, if I see this opposite arrangement, it means it's either going to be an ash, um, a maple, or like this guy, which is our dogwood. Now we're right on the border of it being native. It's You see it more frequently on the East Coast. And that's kind of why I like it. I'm from Virginia, so it kind of reminds me of home. Um, I did want to mention about if you are thinking about planting a tree, uh, the best time to, to do that is uh, September. Um, it allows those trees to get uh, a good root establishment um, before the summer comes. Um, so like if you buy a, like a, bur, uh, a ball and burlap tree, um, that ball and burlap, you're only getting 5% of the root system. So if you get that tree uh, and you put it out in the springtime and we heat up really fast, then um, you're going to have a tough time keeping it happy. Um, so uh, again, best time to do it is in the fall. You can get, a, get away with earlier in spring, but um, if you can wait, I would. Uh, this tree that I'm looking at now, you can see those opposite arrangements. This is a maple. Uh, this is a Caddo maple. And when I say Caddo, um, I'm referring to Caddo County in Oklahoma. This guy was uh, discovered down there. Just a great little under uh, shade tree, you know, uh, 25, 30 foot, um, maybe a shorter spread, but it's, it's, got, a, it's got a great form. Okay, so I was walking um, over to this tree I want to show you guys, but I saw this really cool thing I wanted to point out. This is Lonstera uh, sempervirens. This is our native honeysuckle. Um, it's sometimes called the coral honeysuckle, and you can see it's more tubular than the Lonstera japonica, um, which kind of has those more exaggerated petals. Um, now that Japanese honeysuckle is considered invasive. Uh, so I would look for this guy. Um, it's it's the beginning of April, um, so it's already looking good. Uh, but the main one I wanted to show you was this, this cross vine, and he's getting ready to bloom. Um, I wanted to point him out to uh, to encourage uh, planting this guy more opposed to the, to the uh, trumpet vine that also has this kind of orange bell-shaped flower. But it has um it doesn't have this simple leaf it's a it's a bipinnate leaf so so it looks you know like a divided leaf um that trumpet trumpet vine is invasive if it gets on your house it, it'll it'll quickly cover it 
Um, it roots underground, spreads through rhizomes, so it's almost impossible to get rid of. Um, so this guy, cross vine, plant the cross vine. Not, this is a akebia, this. Plant the cross vine, opposed to the um, trumpet vine. There's another. Okay, uh, I just wanted to revisit what I was talking about earlier about watering deep and infrequent. That's the way you want to water. Good way to do that is these gator bags. Uh, they fill up about 10 gallons and they'll drip over about five to eight hours. So that water goes deep into that subsoil, helps those roots um, get deeper, better system. And uh, what I wanted to sh show you is the differences. So this guy, we water um, through this um, gator bag. This is another caddo maple and I'll show you another one that was planted at the exact same time. So this guy, um, no gator bag, they've been irrigating through a lawn sprinkler, so shallow system. And you can see this guy not quite leafing out. Actually, they might, if you ever wonder if you have a live tree or not, you could always give it the scratch test. The vascular cambium is right below the bark so you can scratch it a little bit. And if you see green, it's still alive, but this guy, see all that brown. Yeah, this guy, they, they lost this guy. So not to say that it's due to watering, but I'm sure that was a big factor. Okay. So just making the point a little more. That's the tree I showed you uh, to begin with and then across the street. And to be, you know, full disclosure, these are also ours. Um, watered with the gator bag, but you can see they're, they're budding out already. So we'll continue filling up these bags in uh, periods of drought. Get this guy to get, be good and established and he'll be a, he'll be a great tree. There's another Caddo Maple. So I hope I answered some questions or at least gave you uh, enough to start uh, um, planning your garden. So if, if I were you, uh, my first steps would be to um, visit my garden space um, a couple times a day to see how the shade, how the sun uh, falls. And then once you, once you know um, that you have a, a shady spot or a sunny spot, then you can start looking at plant material. And what you'll want to do is you'll want to look for material that um, meets the cultural requirements that you have. So you wouldn't want to put like a dogwood that wants to be understory and protected from the sun all day. You wouldn't want to put him out in the field, you know. So match plant with environment. And I know I talked strictly about natives today. Uh, natives are gonna be stronger. They're gonna support wildlife. They're gonna require less resources. Uh, but that, and, and they're great to use and you should use them, but it doesn't mean that that's all uh, you should use. You can mix it up. Um, you do some of your pretty annual color stuff uh, with your natives. Uh, you could even do vegetables with you. No, nobody, nobody says you can't mix it up. So um, I hope this helps. And uh, if you have any uh, questions, feel free to post them in the comments.